Good morning, everyone. So good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. We are delighted that you are here. If you have your bulletin in hand, please take it and we'll open it up. And inside you'll find, of course, your study guide and also the uh, catechism questions on the reverse side, which we'll use a little later on in the service. But you'll, uh, those of you who like to fill in blanks, we've got a few blanks for you today during the sermon, so you'll enjoy those. And then, uh, of course, all kinds of announcements. One of the big ones, of course, is that at the end of the service, I'll just give you a heads up, we'll mention it later too, but at the end of the service, we... On, on this Sunday, we always do what we call a shoebox brigade, which is for Operation uh, Christmas Child Shoeboxes. And so if you're able to stay and help, it's always, such, it's always a, a great way to uh, get the boxes to the, uh, to the waiting car that will take them over to the distribution point uh, tomorrow, the collection point to, uh, this afternoon. And so I hope you're able to stay for that and, and help us to do that. It gives us an opportunity to pray for the uh, children who will be receiving them as well. So we encourage you to, to, to do that. I think that's the only announcement I have uh, at this time. But we do want to encourage you to take your, uh, the perforated section of your bulletin and just, just tear that off right now. And we want to say thank you to all who are here, perhaps for the first time or first time in a long time. So, Look around. I think I recognize everyone, but uh, we're glad that you are here. And if you want to communicate with us, this is the best really way to do it. If you have something you need to share uh, with us, sometimes folks have a change of address or phone number, email, something like that to, to share with us. But especially if you are here as a guest, we want a record of your visit. If you would uh, do us uh, that uh, favor, please. And there's a place at the back to drop these off. It says offering box. If you came prepared to give, that's also a place where you can, can deposit those offerings. Our call to worship this morning is one of the, the great psalms of Scripture. They're all great, but Psalm 100 is a psalm of praise. Can everybody read that okay? But I would like for us to, let's stand together and offer this as an act of praise together in unison, sharing in Psalm 100. And I'll just turn around and share it with you. Let's together, uh, together in unison to the Lord. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and His faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Amen. As we go to the Lord in prayer, you may want to remain standing. You may want to sit or kneel as we go to the Lord in prayer, particularly in confession of sin, but also to remember uh, those in our community have lost loved ones, particularly the Burnett family in, in Maysville and the uh, Mays family in Union Star due to the accident that happened uh, a couple of days ago. We are, Our hearts are burdened for them. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and if you would join me. One of the prayers from the Valley of Vision, these are Puritan prayers, says this, Benign Lord, I praise Thee continually for permission to approach Thy throne of grace and to spread my wants and desires before Thee. I'm not worthy of Thy blessings and mercies, for I'm far gone from original righteousness. My depraved nature reveals itself in disobedience and rebellion. My early days discovered in me discontentment, pride, envy, revenge. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor the multiplied transgressions of later years. My failure to improve time and talents, my abuse of mercies and means, my wasted Sabbaths, my perverted seasons of grace, my long neglect of thy great salvation, my disregard of the friend of sinners. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Our Heavenly Father, most gracious, most kind, most merciful, you are the one who has loved us with an everlasting love. And so we approach you today with thanksgiving. And Lord, particularly at this season of the year when we, when the word thanksgiving is on just about everyone's lips, even those who pay no regard to the Lord Jesus still talk about gathering for thanksgiving. Thank you that we know who we are giving thanks to. The Lord and giver of life, the true and the living God, the source of all blessing and the source of every breath that we take, every step that we make, Lord, comes from you. You are the one who causes us to awaken in a little resurrection every morning after we have slept in a little death. You grant us the awakening of eyes and the awakening of hearts. Or for those who are trust, truly believers in you, you have awakened our hearts. You have given us new life in Christ. And how we thank you for that. Father, our hearts are burdened this morning and we pray for those who have lost loved ones Especially this week, we pray for the Burnett family. We pray for the Mays family. We ask that you would be very near to them, close to them. And that uh, children who, who have been deprived of their father, wife of her husband, husband of his wife, children and grandchildren of their mother and grandmother, all of these relationships are very tender, and we hold them uh, very close to our hearts. We pray that your blessing would be upon them. We thank you, uh, Lord, that uh, Mike knew you, uh, particularly we know that uh, from his testimony, and we pray for, for them. Lord, we pray for the comfort of your love and uh, your grace to be upon them. Father, we also come before you confessing our sins, how we have transgressed your law, how we have wandered into iniquity, how we have fallen short of your glory. Lord, that's happened not just this week or today, but even in this very hour. So, Lord, we ask that the, for, the, for the forgiveness of sins, which you have declared to be ours, would be applied once again, and that we would be cleansed by the precious blood of Christ. As we approach you in your throne of grace to receive mercy in our time of need, we thank you for that gracious privilege. And we thank you, Lord, further for the opportunity to worship you. May it be in spirit and in truth. And may Jesus receive all of the honor and the glory and the praise. We pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. From God's word, we have these wonderful words of assurance of God's pardon from Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 7, which says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we approach the Lord now in song, responding to his wonderful words, God come and lead us.
You may be seated. We've been confessing our faith these past several weeks uh, by means of the Baptist Catechism, so-called because it was produced by uh, English particular Baptists back in the early 1690s. They uh, produced their confession of faith, the so-called London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, and then just a few years later, four years later or so, decided that there was a, a need to have a tool to catechize their children, which just means to teach using questions and answers. And so last week we considered the preface to the, to the Ten Commandments. And one of the things that's common among, really among all of the catechisms that I'm aware of, is there is this teaching through the Ten Commandments. And the way that it's typically done is how you see it in, uh, in these questions. What is it? What is required of it? What is forbidden in it? And then what are we especially taught if there is a, a, a particular teaching? So today we're on questions 51 through 54 dealing with the first commandment. And the question is, which is the first commandment? The answer is, the first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And what is required in the first commandment? Answer, the first commandment requires us to know and acknowledge God to be the only true God and our God and to worship and glorify Him accordingly. And then what is forbidden in the first commandment? Answer, the first commandment forbids us to deny or not to worship and glorify the true God as God and our God and to give that worship and glory to any other which is due unto Him alone. And lastly, what are we especially taught by these words before me in the first commandment? Answer, these words before me in the first commandment teach us that God who sees all things takes notice of and is much displeased with the sin of having any other God. And so we've confessed our faith and we respond singing only a holy God. We want to present this song to you and have you sing on the stand on the last verse and sing. You can sing along if you'd like, but uh, we just want you to kind of focus on the words. Just a reminder of why we have that first commandment. It's because of who God is and His holiness. So we want to.
We continue our reading through the book of Exodus with uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, which details the fifth and sixth plagues. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And the next day the Lord did this thing. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln, and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt, and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Israel of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses threw it in the air, and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Amen. Pharaoh soon realized that God, the great I am, was God and that the Israelites were his people. And we have that outlook today. We are people of God. We are people of the king. And so we're going to sing this song that says, A Child of the King. It's 555 in your hymnal, or we'll have it up on the screen. Uh, let's sing together. My father is rich in houses and lands. He holds the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are filled. He has riches and gold. I'm a child of the for that reminder, Pastor Kyle and praise team, that we are children of the King if we've trusted in him. And that gives us another reason to say our children are, are going to be practicing for their program coming up on December 
18th, and they'll be taking these next few Sundays to do that. Uh, so children are dismissed if they would like to participate in that. If you have your Bible, I would ask to, you to turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, we'll be reading verses 19 through 31 in just a few moments in our uh, study through the book of, of Luke. As you're turning there, I want to share with you what really is a rather well-known sermon outline. I heard it once or twice, maybe when I was a child, and I never forgot it. You know, there are certain outlines that you just never, ever forget. My sermons are not mostly like that. Mostly they are forgettable, and you just you take them for what they are uh, in the moment, and then afterwards you go, well, that was a... That was nourishing, but I probably won't ever have a, chance, a reason to remember it again. Now, I hope that you're maybe different uh, than most people, but that's the way most people would be. This outline is uh, well known for its sort of just strong uh, nature, its, its short nature, and it goes something like this. Life is short, death is certain, hell is hot, heaven is sweet. Now, I like that outline, and I think it, it, what it says is true. My only complaint about it is it says really nothing about Jesus. And we want to emphasize that Jesus is a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And so that probably belongs between hell is hot and heaven is sweet. So we can add that if we want to. But even though that's sort of a, a short, some might even say a trivial outline related to these grave matters... We don't believe that the subjects of life, death, hell, and heaven are at all trivial matters. They are important matters. They are gravely important, and especially the matter of hell should give us a, a cause to have great solemnity of spirit and sobriety and seriousness. You know, occasionally I'll see a, a cartoon or a comic that, that sort of pokes fun at or, or has fun with the subject of hell or heaven and I cringe just a little bit inside because I know that that's not how the Lord would want us to handle those subjects, to trivialize or to poke fun at them. Even certain jokes that, that uh, talk about you know, someone dying and going to the pearly gates and St. Peter uh, you know, meeting them there and then it goes on from there. I'm not going to actually tell a joke that I think is probably not a good thing to do. Uh, but that's the, uh, that's the trivialness with which sometimes these matters are treated in our popular culture. And I would, I would just call us all as believers, and, and even if you are not yet a believer, I would encourage you to hear the seriousness of this. These are matters of great sobriety. They do not be, need to be treated with trivialness. Erwin Lutzer opens his book, One Minute After You Die, with the following paragraph. One minute after you slip behind the parted curtain, you will either be enjoying a personal welcome from Christ or catching your first glimpse of gloom as you have never known it. Either way, your future will be irrevocably fixed and eternally unchangeable. Now at this point, I need to stop and clarify something that Lutzer is not saying, and it could be misunderstood, so I want to be careful to clarify. He's not saying that one's eternal destiny is somehow decided after death in that one minute. He's simply saying that one minute after you die, these things will become abundantly clear to you. But it's, what he's saying here is that only those who have trusted savingly in Jesus with genuine repentant faith in this life prior to death, prior to going, as he says, behind that parted curtain into the, the, the afterlife, as it were, even though only those will enjoy eternity with God in heaven. Those who have not trusted savingly in Jesus, those who have not had a repentant faith, who have not turned to him, will not enjoy eternity in heaven with the Lord. Rather, those who have not trusted in Christ will spend eternity in a place the Bible calls hell. And that is eternal separation from God's love, mercy, and compassion. But it is being eternally united 
to his wrath and judgment against sin. And I say this through tears, as it were. I do not say it with any kind of joy or, uh, or glee. It is sober. Be reconciled to God through Christ. It is a matter of eternal importance, eternal significance. Heaven and hell hang in the balance. Now we understand the Lord is sovereignly drawing those to himself whom he calls and whom he, whom he is cho- has chosen and we understand all of that. But if you know that you are a sinner and you have not yet trusted in Christ, you know you need a Savior Do not hesitate to call upon the Lord today because all who call upon the Lord will be saved. And that idea of call is calling in faith, calling in repentance, trusting in Him. So I encourage you, I really plead with you to do so if you have not yet, lest it become everlastingly too late. And I know this this is such a somber way to open the sermon. But it's a sober topic. Not everything is, is a matter of sweetness and light, as it were. Although, when we consider hell and heaven, we do consider the sweetness of heaven. We consider the, the lightness of heaven. But it's always weighed out against the, the gravity of hell. So I want us to think about those two things together today. We're going to be considering this subject of heaven and hell in our continuing study through the gospel of Luke. As it happens, we're in Luke chapter 16, 19 through through 31. And this is one of the great texts on the subject. And it's where Jesus gives the account of the rich man and Lazarus. I think that you will probably recognize it if you don't, perhaps maybe the first time you've ever heard it. I think you'll understand what I'm talking about. And as we read, I want you to remember that this is not a comprehensive study on the subject of the afterlife. Sometimes we can get caught up in certain details and want to want to uh, think, well, this is giving us all the information we need to know. No, rather, it is a glimpse of the afterlife. And there's much more that the Bible has to say about that as a subject. So let's read together. And if you're able to stand in honor of God's word, I would ask you to do so as we begin in verse 19 of Luke chapter 16. And these are the words of Jesus. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, or in hell, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able And none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. And our prayer is that he would inscribe its eternal truths on our hearts this morning. 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, when we come to this passage, most often you hear it described as a parable. I think perhaps even some of our, some of our translations put in there the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Mine doesn't say parable here. And I think the reason that even some scholars are hesitant to say parable uh, and they choose rather the, the term account is that there is a matter of some debate whether it's a parable or not. And I don't want to get too deep into this matter, but just think of, think of it this way. Some call it a parable, but it doesn't fit the typical parabolic style of an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's how we usually think of a parable, right? It's a story that's, that's here on earth, and then there's this heavenly meaning to it. In this passage, how much of what we just read takes place on the other side of the grave? Over half. Well over half, at least half. So it could just as easily be called a heavenly story with an earthly application. If it is a parable, it's more of an example story, a cautionary tale of how loving wealth and, and disregarding the poor around him revealed this rich man to be an unregenerate, unredeemed, unrepentant, and ultimately unconverted heart. Now, if you look at the first chapter of chapter, or the first part of rather of chapter 16, which we looked at a few weeks ago, Jesus uses a difficult parable there to address the proper use of money and how that relates to eternity. Now, in the middle section, in the middle section of the chapter, Jesus identifies Pharisees as what? What does he say they are? They are lovers of money. They love money. They love the, the what sometimes called mammon. And so now, in the closing verses of the same chapter, Jesus has this story of two men, one rich, one poor. And here we see an illustration of how the abuses of, rather the abuse of riches eventually led the rich man to eternity apart from God. And that is the great sobering truth in this passage. So let's consider what we're looking at this morning in the summary of this sermon. I've given it to you in your outline. And that is this. Either you will live and die reconciled to God or you will live and die separated from Him. You will live and die reconciled to God or you will live and die separated from Him. Those two are mutually exclusive from one another. That's why I say it's a matter of grave importance that we understand this. And in this passage, we see these truths concentrated in one account. And we see them contrasted in the three universal experiences of humanity. And we see it in these two characters, uh, the rich man and Lazarus. By the way, sometimes you'll hear the rich man referred to by a name. Does anyone know the name that sometimes we refer to the rich man as? You ever heard it? Maybe in a, in a spiritual... Sometimes he's called Dives. Rich man Dives. Uh, and that just goes back to the Latin version of this where rich man, or the term rich, is, is, is uh, the Latin word Dives. So if you ever hear that, you'll know where that comes from. It's not in the English text as we have it. So let's look at these three universal experiences. And the first one is this, that everyone who lives eventually dies. Now you might say, well, preacher, that is such an elementary thing. Why would you even bring that up? We need to, we need to consider it. Because don't you, don't you know, now I'm no longer 23. <laughs> I'm 53. Uh, and I never thought that I would uh, have a different opinion when I was 23. But I have lots of different opinions now than I had then. Most of them relate to my own mortality. And if you are wise, you will also consider your own mortality. And children, young people, youth, every age. I've said it before, we don't know who the old people are. We think of someone who is up in years as being closer to death, they very well might be, or we might be. We do not know. We can never be certain about our own passing. 
our own passing from this life to the next. Only the Lord knows how well that is brought home to us, when, especially when we face tragic deaths or unexpected deaths. This is the fact that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between those who are born and those who die. In other words, the death rate is 100%. I mean, we can think of exceptions to this well-established rule. We can speak of Enoch in the book of Genesis, which, about whom it says he walked with God and was not, for God took him. Well, that's, that's just showing us that there's going to be a catching up one day. There's going to be a, a uh, going to meet the Lord one day. And some will experience that without death. Enoch is the first fruits of that, as it were, we might say. Or Elijah, whom God took directly to heaven on chariots of fire. Or Jesus, who rose victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. But these exceptions only serve to drive home the truth that, with greater certainty that man knows not his time. And death waits for us all. Now those who are in Christ Jesus have the resurrection to look forward to. They have the new, not only new life in Christ, but you have the expectation that one day we will be raised in new bodies. Every time we attend a funeral, every time we go to the graveside, and by the way, I encourage you, if you have an aversion to funerals or gravesides, I would encourage you to try to overcome that because it's important that we go and we stand among the stones and we read those names and we read those dates and we understand that one day every one of those graves will be opened up. Every one of them. The resurrection for the just and the unjust, by the way, that's what the scripture says. I don't have any idea how all that's going to, to look or work, but I know the Bible teaches it, and we are looking forward to that. Now, these two men that we're talking about today could not have been more different in life or in death. Think about this. One was rich, the other was poor. One dressed like a king in the most expensive clothes. In fact, what it says, the combination of purple and fine linen stands for the ultimate in luxury. The purple, understand, was, uh, that came, came from a dye that was made from murex, which was a very rare form of muscle that was in the, in the, ocean, in the uh, Mediterranean. And it required a lot of, of effort to make this. So anyone who had this kind of purple cloth would have been very well off. And then the linen, of course, as an undergarment, would have been the finest of undergarments. So he was clothed with the finest of clothes. The other's body was not. He was covered with what? Sores. One resided within palatial confines, which were a gilded tribute to his enormous fortune. The other was left at the rich man's gate, presumably because he could not even walk. We're not told, but that's what the implication is. Much less work to earn a living. So one feasted lavishly every day on the finest foods. And this is a reference to the enjoyment and merrymaking as much as to the eating. Remember what Jesus says about others who are rich uh, when they say, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. The other longed to just eat the crumbs from the table. Probably a reference to the thin slices of bread which were used as napkins to absorb the grease and the gravy from the rich man's hands as he ate and then cast aside for the dogs to eat. But instead of the dogs eating those crumbs and just stopping at those crumbs, Lazarus ate those crumbs and the dogs came and licked Lazarus's sores. By the way, I think I believe that Jesus includes this detail to show that Lazarus would have been considered unclean because dogs being an unclean animal, them coming to lick his sores would have rendered him unclean if nothing else. So here he is depicted as an unclean person and the and the rich man it would be, would have been considered by most people to be virtuous and righteous by reason of his wealth and Lazarus would have been considered the opposite. One had all that he could ever wanted. The other had nothing at all. 
And even though they could not have been more different, in this respect they were the same. And what is that respect? They both died. They both died. Take note here, riches can never cheat death out of its due. We can only imagine what death must have been like for Lazarus. He was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. This is a figure of speech used to refer to the place of blessedness, the place of comfort, the place of eternal peace and rest. The rich man, it says, also died and was buried. Very likely given the burial of a prince since money was no object. You know, it's interesting, it doesn't say anything about Lazarus' burial. Being unclean, being covered with sores, being a poor person. He may have even been just cast upon the burning heap at Gehenna, which people referred to then as hell, what we would use the term hell, Gehenna. It's a place of everlasting burning. Oh, but how different was their eternal destiny? The time and circumstances of their death are of little account here. They both died, they both passed into eternity. And this is a reminder to us of the second universal human experience, which is this, that everyone who dies enters eternity. So here we go. Everyone who lives ultimately dies. And everyone who dies enters eternity. It may be sooner, it may be later, but it happens. And that's what we see in verses 23 and 24. Just rereading it. What does it say? It says, And in Hades... Being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in anguish in this flame. Jesus could not be more clear that there is anguish and pain and flame involved here in what the Bible refers to as hell. And by the way, the mouth which partook of the finest of meals all through his life now longs for just one little drop of water to quench his thirst. Imagine for a moment that the date is November 20th, 2142. That's exactly 120 years from today. Now we could choose an earlier date or a later one, but I would imagine that there's not one person within the sound of my voice today that will breathe, be breathing air on planet Earth that day. That's, that's a guess, but I'm, I think it's a pretty good guess. That being as it may, we will all be conscious somewhere in eternity. This is the plain teaching of Scripture. It's basic Christianity. And according to Scripture, our only two destinations are heaven and hell. And they're mutually exclusive of each other. They're not some admixture between the two. They're one or the other. And we see those mutually exclusive destinations illustrated right here. I don't want us to get bogged down in the details, and I wouldn't encourage you to get tripped up on, on certain uh, things in the, in the text here, uh, like, you know, what is this Abraham's side or bosom, and what is this uh, chasm and things. Just understand, we're talking about an intermediate state of hell and heaven prior to the resurrection. That's all that we really need to understand there. So when it says that the rich man lifted up his eyes in Hades, we need to remember that most often this term, the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew sheol, which is called the grave, is used in general for the place of all the departed, whether good or bad. But in the New Testament, what do we have? It's never used of those who are saved. It's never used of those who went to be with the Lord in, in a But rather, in the, in the New Testament, this pa in this passage, rather, Hades is used as a synonym for the place I just mentioned a minute ago, Gehenna. 
And that was a place of punishment where the fire never ceased to burn. And that's what they referred to as the dump, the, 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 the heap for trash outside the walls of Jerusalem. It was commonly referred to as Gehenna because it had this never ceasing flame. Things were always burning out there. So the rich man was in what? He was in torment. His torment was perhaps intensified because not only did he see Abraham afar off, but who did he see at Abraham's side? Lazarus. Lazarus. And what is he asking for in his tormented state? Is he asking for his purple and linen robes to be brought to him? No. Is he asking for the sumptuous and lavish feast that he enjoyed all through his life to be brought to him? No. Is he asking for any of a thousand things that all the riches could have afforded him in this life on earth? No. No and no. He is not asking for any of those things. He is asking for the merciful and compassionate Father Abraham, the founder of the covenant, in which this man placed his trust to send Lazarus with just a drop of water on his finger to cool his tongue, for he was tormented in the flame. Just a single drop, Father Abraham. Just send him and allow my, my burning, flaming tongue to be satisfied with just one drop. What I would not give for one drop of water to be brought to me in my torment. This is the words of the rich man. Do you see the irony here? Do you see it? The rich man is not made out to be intentionally mean or hateful or cruel to Lazarus. He just didn't seem to care. While they were both living, he was simply thoughtless. He was simply lacking in mercy or compassion. Now the shoe's on the other foot, and he is the one in need. He is the one who is crying out he is the one who is in need of satisfaction and freedom from torment. But instead of mercy, what does he receive? He receives judgment. And then we are reminded then of this third universal human experience. And that is that everyone who enters eternity faces judgment. So everyone who lives dies. Everyone who dies Enters eternity, everyone who enters eternity faces judgment. You see how it's all connected. And we see that in verses 25 through 31, which we just read a, a few moments ago. For the believer, the judgment is not heaven or hell. I want you to be, understand that. For the one who has already trusted in Christ who in this life has savingly trusted in Christ, who has repented of sin and has been reconciled to God through Christ, through His finished work on the cross, and is in union with Him, the judgment is not heaven or hell. That judgment, the judgment of hell, has already been borne by Christ in His death on the cross on behalf of everyone who had put their trust savingly in Him. That's critical information. Judgment for a believer then is what? It is a judgment of your works at the judgment seat of Christ. A judgment which will cleanse all the wood and hay and stubble and away from all the gold and silver and precious stones. In fact, that's just a reference, by the way, to 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 13. If you would uh, turn there with me, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Paul is talking about this when he says, According to the grace of God given to me, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day, capital D, day, will disclose it because it will be revealed by what? Fire. 
and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So for the believer, we're talking about a judgment of works, a judgment of rewards. And in that judgment, all that is done for the glory of self is the wood, the hay, the stubble, and all that is done for the glory of Christ and his kingdom is the gold, the silver, the precious stones, and that which will remain into eternity. Now Jesus said in another place, Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And that is the judgment for the unbeliever. For the unbeliever, the judgment is not a judgment of works. It is not a judgment where the judge brings out the scale and puts all your good works on one side and all your, all your bad works on the other side of the scales to see if your good outweighs your bad. That is not what the Bible teaches. That is what popular religion teaches, and that is, in fact, what Islam teaches, by the way, if we're, if we're looking at it. But any other, any other religion is going to be looking at, at this based on works entirely. And if your good outweighs your bad, then you may go to paradise. If not, you may go to hell. But that is not what the Scripture teaches. Not in the least. For all those who have not trusted in the finished work of Christ on the cross for salvation, there is only one verdict in this judgment, and that is Eternal separation from God. Again, bringing us back to the soberness of this, the sobriety of this, the solemnity of what we're talking about. It is serious business, folks. And from these verses, we see the judgment, first of all, and this is where you might want to use your pencil to fill in these blanks, the judgment of memory. Look at verse 25. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. So this is the memory. Abraham says, Child or son, remember. What did he ask him to remember? He asked him to search back through his memory, to look back in, into his life and how it was in deep contrast to Lazarus. You received your good things. Emphasis on the your. He needs here to remember that he never gave a thought for laying up treasure in heaven. He never gave a thought for investing in eternal things. His only thought was for consuming the good things. Hey, it's the good life. And for him, it was his best life now, I promise you. He was receiving his good things in that moment. His only thought was for consuming those things. He lived as if he would never give an account to God. That he would never appear before the judgment of God. And that's how he squandered his wealth, on things for himself. But not only is there the judgment of memory here, there's also the judgment of separation. Verse 26, what does it say? And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm, a great gulf, has been fixed term fixed means it is, has a permanent nature. In order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. So there is separation. So in addition to the judgment of memory, Abraham points out this great chasm fixed and immovable between those experiencing the torment of hell and those experiencing the comforts of heaven. Think Grand Canyon. Think Royal Gorge. These are the best we can do in terms of our human experience to understand just what we're talking about. An impassable kind of chasm. Not only between those who have gone to heaven or hell, but more importantly, those in the place of torment are separated from God for eternity, separated from his love and compassion and his grace. This is the quintessential definition of hell, separation from God. But it is not total separation, as I've alluded to a couple of times. Those in hell are united forever 
to the judgment and justice of God, but separated from his love, his mercy, his compassion, his forgiveness, his joys, his pleasures, his kindnesses. That is the nature of God's judgment against sin and all that exalts itself against him. And if you're thinking, wow, God is... God is really vindictive. He's really judgmental over just a little sin. If you find yourself saying that, you have yet to understand the depth and the gravity and the depravity of sin and just how it is to God. How he sees it. He sees it as an affront to his holiness. So we see the judgment of memory, the judgment of separation, and then finally the judgment of regret. That's in verses 27 through 31. Here we see the rich man now foiled in all his attempts to receive anything for himself and resigning himself to the fact that his eternity is sealed. What does he do? He turns his attention where? To his family. Those who are left behind. Those who are, who are, who are still in this life and and. What will become of them? What will become of my five brothers, he wonders. That's another indication to me. Why five brothers if this is not an actual account of something that's happened? It's too late for me to repent and turn to Christ, but perhaps not them. What can be done for them? They can be warned. Can, can Lazarus be sent to them? You know, here's the rich man saying, I never listened to your word, Lord. And neither have my brothers, but maybe they will listen to a word of warning of someone who has witnessed the afterlife firsthand. Maybe a vision or a resurrection or a ghost back from the dead will shock them into repentance. Now, if that was happening today, you'd have all kinds of people jumping on that. Oh, a vi uh, you know, afterlife experience. Let's write a book. Let's make a movie. Let's sell a bunch of stuff. We'll make a million on that. That's not at all what the scripture says. What did Moses and the prophets tell them? Because this is Abraham's response. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And what was it that they said? Well, we find an example of that in Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14. You don't have to turn there, but just listen to this. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. Neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. And if you are hearing echoes of Romans chapter 10, that's on purpose. Because that's exactly what we see in that passage. The rich man instead presses the point and he pretends to be wiser than God on this point. No, but they will listen. They will listen to someone from the dead. They will repent. To which Abraham finally replies with these words, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, they won't be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And it's at this point you have to remember who Jesus is speaking to at the time. He's speaking to the Pharisees. They believed in the resurrection. They religiously kept the law of Moses. And they believed in the resurrection of the dead. But as a group, they were woefully unconverted. They were unregenerated. They were unrepentant in their sin of unbelief concerning Jesus. So what does Jesus know is going to happen? He's talking about the resurrection, isn't he? He knows that they, in their lavish robes, will play judge and jury to see to it that Jesus is taken into custody, stripped naked, beaten beyond all human recognition. And since they can't play executioner, they will manipulate Pilate into pronouncing upon him an undeserved death sentence and sending him to be nailed to a Roman cross where he will die. Not of asphyxiation, which was generally the case with crucifixion victims, but rather of myocardial infarction, that is, his heart exploding. Often referred to as the broken heart, the burst heart, which caused blood and water to flow separately out of the wound, placed in his side by the spear of a Roman soldier. 
All this would happen according to the fixed purpose and foreordination of God. As Jesus would then cry out these words, Tetelestai! It is finished. The price has been paid in full. Oh, as he hung there dying for the sins of the world, he's crying out, it is finished. Three days after his death and burial, what would he do? He would rise from the dead. There is someone who would come back from the dead and it would make no difference at all to the great majority of those who opposed him who spat upon him, who mocked him, who cried out for his blood, they would not be convinced. And why? Because they did not, they would not believe the holy word of God, which was sufficient to bring them to a place of repentance. And Jesus said in another place, Greeks look for wisdom, the Jews look for a sign, but no sign will be given to them except the sign of Jonah. And that is what? Jesus' death and resurrection. Folks, heaven and hell are real. The scriptures are plain on this point. And the answer to all those who wish to escape the coming wrath is to repent of your trust in riches, wealth, family, job, position, you name it, on one hand, and, and repent of your trust in generosity on the other for your salvation. Acknowledge that apart from trusting only in the finished work, because there are many who are trusting in their good works. There are many who are just like the rich man, completely blissfully unaware and not caring. But there are others who are trying to somehow earn their way into heaven by doing good things and saying, well, I do this and I do that and I help this, I help this organization and I volunteer over here and I think all that's going to get me in good with God. It's not! It is not. All of those things are fine and they should all flow out of your relationship with Christ, your union with Christ, your thanksgiving to Him as, as good works, fruit of salvation, but they will never save you. Trusting in those things will never, ever, ever get you into right standing with God. Only trusting in the finished work of Christ. Because apart from that, we are all condemned and hell-deserving sinners. Not one of us is righteous. And we all need to come to Him in faith. And if you do so, He will save you. Questions of heaven and hell are matters of eternal importance. And my question to you is, where will you spend eternity? That is the most critical question. If you die tonight and appear before God and He asked you this question, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to Him? Would you say to him, well, I was a pretty good person. I volunteered for this organization. I was a member of the church. I participated in, in the ordinances of the church. I heard preaching. I did all those religious things. And what he will say to you is, depart from me, I never knew you. The only response that will gain any traction at all is this. That simply, I trusted in Christ. Christ died for me. And I, He alone can save me. Not any works that I have done, but only the works of Christ. You pray with me. Our Father and our God, these are hard words to hear. They are hard words to preach. They are so sobering to us. But Lord, may that sobriety bring us to a moment of reckoning. And Father, I pray especially for those who may not yet know you, and I do not know the eternal state of any of those, of all those who are here today. Only you do. So Lord, we pray that in these moments that you, by your Spirit, would take and change hearts, draw them to yourself, or to awaken from death and bring to life, regenerate and convert as only you can. 
cause them to respond in repentant faith to you. For believers, Lord, we pray that we would be encouraged and in, emboldened and strengthened to live lives of service for you. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we come to this moment of reflection and commitment, we're going to stand, we're going to sing. I am thine, O Lord. I pray that these words do reflect your heart, that as you say them, they are actually a confession of faith. If, if, you, are not, if you do not yet belong to the Lord in faith, I encourage you to pause and strongly consider those words. That as we sing, you might be confessing the truth of your life. I'll be here to pray with you if there's any specific need that you have that you want to talk about, counseling that you need to, uh, to have about any particular subject. You may want to know more about the gospel and how to respond savingly, how to place your faith and trust in Christ and His finished work. And we want to be able to share that with you in a full way. So you come as the Lord leads you to come as we sing. Greg always says that invitation never closes. Right. If you want to visit and talk with somebody or you just have questions about your understanding of Christ and our relationship with him, um, don't just let those things sit there. Visit with somebody and talk with somebody and uh, help them, let them take you to the scriptures. Amen. Um, on the back of your bulletin this week, we have a lot of a lot of neat things that are going on, not just because they're neat things, but they're ministry things we can do. And we can share this whole message we've been talking about today with our community. Uh, first one is on Tuesday, uh, we have our um, community Christmas dinner. We're calling it Thanksgiving Christmas dinner. Thanksgiving You're dinner. ahead of yourself. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner. And so the idea is the uh, church is going to, uh, I say the church, we have some church members who've been working hard already. Those turkeys have been thawing and getting ready to be cooked. And so we're going to have turkey uh taters and gravy and uh, stuff like that. We want to bring side dishes and enjoy a meal together with not only us, but bring someone with you to share that meal with, okay? And let's see, that'll be Tuesday at 6 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. 
Uh, there's also uh, they've set up a thing on the website that is for you to log in and tell us what you're bringing. Is that what we want to do? Sign up genius, yeah. That way you can, will people be able to see what other people are bringing when they do that, I wonder? I think so, yeah. And that way, so hopefully you'll, you'll, we won't get uh, uh, six or seven things of sweet potatoes and oh, that nothing would be else. Fun. Yeah, that'd be okay, but <laughs> nothing else. Would be. <laughs> so anyway, if you don't do the website, if you don't do computery stuff, just bring your food and come on and bring your people and come on. Yeah. That's just an opportunity to try to help a little bit in that, so not required. Um, and I am not going to waste time figuring out what the thing is that I forgot to talk about. <laughs> Pastor Greg, <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. Well, just a couple of rehearsals left for Christmas uh, community choir. I don't know if you want to mention that or not. I would say... If you're not in by this time, you might want to... I was going to say, if you haven't been to rehearsals yet, come to the performance. We're going to pre <laughs> present it to you. You'll be in the audience. Bring some people. That's going to be this coming December uh, the 11th. So start getting people, uh, start getting your car loads together to come and watch that. That's right. 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock on the 11th. So. That's right. This will be the first time in three years that this has been done. And, yep. and uh, so we're thankful for the opportunity to do that. Last was in 2019. So any other announcement before we are dismissed today? I want to leave you out. All right, let's stand together then and be... Uh, dismissed with a benediction, but I'm not going to say leave just yet. Okay, what I'm going to I'm going to give you wait further instructions after the benediction. All right. So with these words, we we send you out into the world to love and to serve the Savior, to love and serve your fellow man who needs uh, your acts of service, who needs your love, and we uh, share these words of blessing. The Lord bless you. And keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to form a shoebox brigade. Now it's like a fire brigade, only we're not using buckets of water, we're using <laughs> boxes. And I'm going to need someone to come down here, uh, preferably a youth or an adult, to come down here and start passing the boxes, and we'll form this. Yeah, if you, if you, if you, need, to, uh, if you need to make your exit, feel free to do that, but we're going to start up here and just come on and make a line. You can be the head there. And we'll go all the way out the door and out to the north door where the chariot awaits for the boxes. So let's do it. And let's pray. Just one more time. Let's pray for those who will be receiving these as well. If you could just join with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we do pray a blessing upon all of those who will be receiving these uh, shoe boxes filled with, with good things. We pray that it mostly would be that they hear the gospel proclaimed. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. We may need to make sure that we've got enough line to go all the way out to the... Uh,